Hello and welcome to News Clicks International Roundup. The past couple of days saw an escalation of conflict in the Crimean region with three Ukrainian vessels entering into the Sea of Azov to the Kerch Straits in violation of international law. Now these boats have been stopped and the sailors have been detained by Russia. But this also points to a larger attempt at sparking, sparking conflict between Ukraine and Russia, which have already been at loggerheads for the past couple of years over Crimea. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Parkaisa, Editor-in-Chief, News Click. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so could you first start with a quick description of what exactly is the strategic intent behind an operation like this, especially at this point of time where there has not been any particular, there doesn't seem to be any particular obvious reason for this. Well, there are two parts to it. One is what really happened. And uh, I would say that to say that it's in, they were, the Ukrainian vessels were doing this in violation of international law, of course, begs the question, what is the status of Crimea, which is where the whole thing starts right. from. If you accept that Crimea, Crimea is a part of Russian Union, mm -hmm. then of course uh, the Russians would say that's territorial waters right. or what would be called the isthmus that controls the Kerch Strait. That really belongs to Russia right. and therefore Russia's rules or law would, laws would apply and that would be the uh, international law. Right. Ukraine claims that Crimea is really a part of uh, Ukraine right. and therefore it is not to be treated as uh, Russia and therefore this is not the ter territorial water of Russia, they also have rights over there. But even if we accept the Ukrainian argument, the question arises that the 2003 agreement right. between Ukraine and Russia in which they have also agreed to a certain set of things and in this Russia is simply saying that they have some rules, they are not forbidding Ukraine to go to the Sea of Azov. What they have just simply said is, if you want to go, declare your purpose, right. declare what uh, you are going to do, and have a pilot From on board. Right. So that this, is, is the inten this intention is very clear. That's a peaceful visit, and it's to go to the uh, port of Maripul, which is an Ukrainian port. Если вам уже до этого разрешали проходить и никаких проблем не было, никто никаких не строил э, препятствий для прохода, то сейчас э, вам сказали, что временно приостановлено движение. Открыли бы движение, по каким причинам, не должен никто никому объяснять. Открыли бы движение, разрешили вам спокойно пройти, и вы бы проследовали, никто бы никак... On this particular occasion, it appears that this is a provocation known which would cause a Russian response. And the provocation was designed perhaps because of internal reasons. Poroshenko is facing a very difficult election. He's only about 7-8% uh, shall we say support right. as shown by the uh, p polls that have come out. So given that, he's, as we all know, a small war is very good for ratings. Exactly. So that's, that could be that flashpoint, a tension-filled incident, something which leads to a bigger, shall we say, confrontation, not necessarily war, the good for Poroshenko. And he wanted immediately to declare a military role. Rule. And if you have military rule, obviously, then you can stop a whole lot of things from right. happening, including the elections. Right. The opposition hasn't agreed to that. They have forced him to declare only limited martial law and uh, not allowed the, also the martial law to be extended more than 30 days. So we have that issue. The second part of it is the US and the NATO have been trying to talk of the Sea of uh, Azov, mm -hmm. that we should have a military presence over right. there. And Mariupol, which is uh, the, the, the Ukrainian port over there, should become a naval base. And this should then allow the Kerch Strait to be used for having military uh, vessels go there to Mariupol and therefore NATO's presence essentially in the Sea of Azov. Right. Now with the 2003 agreement, this is not possible. Even the Ukrainian officials seem to have agreed that Russia is technically with Absolutely. this legal rights mm -hmm. 
to do what it has done. Therefore, they are more talking of the spirit of international law, etc., not the technically legal part of it, which derives from the 2003 uh, agreement that they have, which is still extended. In spite of all the hostilities with the two countries, that has not been abrogated. Right. So this is the other part of it, that the intention seems to be also to try and make as of a contested sea. And the, the NATO military forces, including ships to be present in the harbor, the, the depth of Azov Sea is not is such narrow. that you get exactly. a major ma naval Only presence. Only very minor boat skin. Yeah, so it seems to be more a provocation right. in your face kind of thing than any, anything else. And in this particular case, it seems to be Poroshenko trying to engineer an issue. The Russian response has been on the other side also interesting to note because they are afraid that Ukraine can launch an attack on the bridge. And this is a huge, it's a long bridge which ensures that Crimea cannot be isolated from, from Russia, Russia right. easily. But the bridge itself is a, is a, shall we say, a soft target. If that is damaged, blown up, anything that happens to it, then of course it's a huge loss to Russia. And this tug which was going there, they, they seem to have had apprehensions that this kind of vessels could be used to damage the bridge. Right. And that's the, one of the reasons that they have these rules of declaration of purpose, also a pilot on board. All of this is really to protect the Kerch bridge. So this is, I think, the, uh, the Russian reaction is to be understood that they have a genuine concern. Also, the Crimean, uh, some of the people, some of the lawmakers have talked about blowing up the bridge. Exactly. So it's not a simply a, shall we say, an idle speculation or a, just a rhetoric. There seems to be some basis for their fear as well. So this is really the immediacy of the, co of the conflict or the immediacy of the situation. And uh, we also have seen that Ukraine has declared uh, martial law, right. but it is now limited to only certain areas in Ukraine, right. bordering Russia, not across Ukraine as Poroshenko wanted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, taking a step back, how do we see the larger significance of Crimea in this context also? Because uh, Russia and Ukraine have been having this conflict for about four years almost. So, how do we see it in this context? Well, you know, with the Crimea Peninsula is a very peculiar issue. It is largely Russian speaking. So it's not that there is a dispute over the nationality or the identity of the people there. It, in the erstwhile Soviet Union, it was given to Crimea, uh, Crimea was given to Ukraine as a gesture of uh, integration. And honestly speaking, at that time, they didn't think these borders were going to lead right. at some point to becoming international borders. And uh, Crimea was uh, therefore uh, given as a part of what was what emerged as the uh, later on as a Ukrainian state, but at that time really a province of the Soviet Union. Now, Sevastopol militarily is very important for the Russian Navy because it connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Right. And of course, the Mediterranean Sea is also the gateway uh, to the Atlantic. Now, if you see Russia, it has one problem that most of its ports are not uh, winter ports because they tend to freeze. Right. The seas tend to freeze. Navigating those winter waters becomes very difficult. Sevastopol is a, also a port which remains open round the year. So militarily, Sevastopol has been extremely important for Russia. And the Crimean's military importance is really also Sevastopol. Right. So therefore, uh, trying to block Sevastopol or trying to take away Crimea not make it a part of uh, Russian Union, Russian Federation. All of it is really a larger game of trying to checkmate uh, Russia's right. naval presence, both in the Mediterranean and also in the Atlantic. So therefore limit it to only summer months, as it were, right. and therefore knocking it out as a major, shall right. we say, naval player, global player. So that's the really the strategic significance of Crimea. And that is what makes uh, Crimean situation much more important than just a small piece of right. land. Right. And if you look at the Ukrainian situation itself, like you said, Poroshenko is uh, trailing in the polls. He doesn't have too much support. And the opposition is united against any major, uh, say, possibility of military rule. At the same time, there seems to be a lot of support from 
your uh, sectors aligned to NATO, think tanks in the West calling for a renewed escalation. So what is the logic behind that kind of a rhetoric right now? You see, one thing is that uh, the response has been as if it's a NATO ally. In uh, one of the exchanges, the US uh, spokesperson, when she was talking, one of the journalists asked, has NATO joined in Ukraine. the last two, three, uh, Ukraine has joined NATO in the last two, three weeks. It's just something that nobody knows about. So this is the other right. issue that, you know, Ukraine is not a part of NATO as yet. And uh, there is a whole set of consequences which follow if Ukraine joins the NATO. One is, of course, the Minsk Accord collapses because it's based on the fact that Ukraine will be neutral. It's not a part of NATO. The NATO powers, how much they're interested in investing in Ukraine, militarily is an open question. Right. Because Ukraine is now being shown as a bankrupt state. It is a complete kleptocracy as its political bosses. Said the whole set of people who are contesting for power, none of them have credibility in this sense. And they're making Ukraine increasingly a basket case in the, in the Baltics. Right. Its support has not come from the major powers. If you see this current escalation, uh, apart from the Baltic countries and strangely enough Canada, which seems to have a lot of you emigre uh, Ukrainian right. population. Other than that, no other major power seems to have supported the Ukrainian escalation. They've given some lip service, but they haven't really gone out on a limb. And apparently Germany has told Poroshenko to stand down. Right. Enough is enough. You know. Uh, talk, talk is okay, but don't escalate it right. further. Neither see, it seems the United States, if Trump's statements on this are to be taken into consideration, that they are also very seriously invested in it, except Nikki Haley in the United Nations Security Council, United Nations Security Council. And Trump says, it's really European countries which right. have to take the lead and we will support. Of course, there's a lot of rhetoric on that. So nobody seems to be very keen on escalating this further. So it does seem that this is going to be another of those, uh, shall we say, incidents where there is a continuous egging on for war. Uh, with Russia, right. and why the shall we say these people are egging on Atlantic Council being one of them, and various other figures, why they are continuously egging on uh, for NATO to attack Russia, attack uh, the, the Crimea, right. take it away from Russia, all of these measures, I'm, at, at, I'm really at a loss to understand, because Asking for nuclear conflict, conflagration seems to be an extremely stupid strategic Precisely. idea. Right. And only deranged minds or people who believe in a never-never land, only they can propose, you know, uh, armed conflict with, nu with two nuclear uh, power, between right. two nuclear powers. Right. So I'm at a loss to understand this rhetoric which keeps on continuously asking for upping the ante and really going to virtually to war against right. Russia. Right. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.